build endurance. Build intensity. Build strength. Myofusion probiotic from Gaspari. Build yourself. Hello, I'm Dr. Tom Dieters and welcome to the Jiu-Jitsu Mania seminar series on performance nutrition and supplementation for combat athletes. Thank you for joining me today at the uh, LA Fit Expo out here in sunny Southern California. I'd like to speak to you today about an issue that I think is critical to unlocking an athlete's potential and that's proper nutrition and proper supplementation. I think that both those components are necessary to augment the training effect for better performance, better endurance, better cardiovascular capacity, whether you're, you're a jiu-jitsu fighter or an MMA fighter. So before I get too far along, I do have to tell you that this presentation today uh, has been brought forth with the help of some very key sponsors. Uh, Gaspari Nutrition, I'll be mentioning some of their uh, formulas later because they have direct application to combat athletes and Brazilian jiu-jitsu athletes. Uh, also House of Pain, who has some great motivating uh, apparel and t-shirts, and also a very interesting kind of cutting edge resistance format via the mass suit, which uses elastic tubing uh, and multi-directional capability to be able to build endurance and help fighters get in better condition. So on our nutritional program, again, I will be speaking about nutrition broadly. When I say diet, I mean the word diet in terms of eating behavior, calories, ratios, meal timings. I don't just mean diet in terms of caloric restriction. Uh, like most people in the United States think of dieting as you know, caloric uh, uh, cutting or deprivation, misery, suffering, starvation. I don't mean that. I mean diet is eating behavior. Because we'll notice that what you eat and when you eat is very, very critical to meeting the momentary nutritional demands of your body. That's the key goal really overall. If I had to put it in a nutshell, the key goal is to meet the momentary nutritional demands of your body. Really no more and no less. We have to give our body what it needs when it needs it. And we have to remember the training is just a stimulus. That's all it is. It's like flipping on a light switch. Your agenda is to go to the gym, get the training effect stimulated, and then the adaptive process takes place largely because of nutritional support in recuperative capabilities. Okay, so my background, uh, I was editor-in-chief of Muscle and Fitness and publisher of Muscle and Fitness Magazine, as well as Flex Magazine and Men's Fitness and Muscle and Fitness Hers uh, for about 15 years for Weeder Publications. I worked with dozens of the world top professional bodybuilding athletes, and as such, we were just immersed in the latest cutting-edge research in performance nutrition, performance supplementation, how it gets applied, uh, as well as strength and conditioning techniques. I uh, worked with a number of professional athletes, fell in love with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu about five and a half years ago, and realized that these athletes who train and fight so hard need this information, maybe more so even than other athletes do. So let's look at our goals of a nutritional program. Again, I put it in a nutshell and said you have to meet the momentary nutritional demands of your body. Well, let's get a little bit more um, developed or detailed in that. And really, we have to supply essential nutrients. You know, everybody wants to talk about sexy supplements. Uh, what's the latest, uh, greatest hot thing to enhance performance? But before we get to that point, we have to meet the essential nutrient demands of our body. We have to give our body the vitamins, minerals, and trace elements that it is incapable of biochemically synthesizing. If we don't take these nutrients in, our body will be in deficit. These nutrients are the metabolic spark plugs of the body. And if you don't have one of these essential nutrients, something negative is going to happen and you are going to be performing suboptimally. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the cognitive feedback capability, the ability to look in the mirror and get up in the morning and say, yeah, I'm a little bit low in B6 today, right? We have to rely on consistent daily supplementation. Many of these essential nutrients are water soluble, they're flushed from the the body in a relatively short period of time and they have to be constant components of our of uh, our uh, nutritional intake but remember before we get to the sexy stuff we have to take care of our essential needs right if we're going to enhance performance then we want to get the proper amounts and ratios at the right time 
to supply energy growth recuperation and repair. So we can't just get all our nutrients in at one time. We don't want to just eat one meal a day. We want to eat small frequent meals. We want to skew our calories so that it mirrors our metabolic output and our caloric intake kind of travel along the same paths. We'll talk about that more uh, in detail in a few minutes. We want to optimize nutrient absorption. That is critical, okay, because how we absorb our nutrients is not just what we eat, it's what we absorb. And there are tips that we can, we can use to be able to enhance absorption capabilities as well. We also want to try to increase the caloric efficiency to speed the metabolism and reduce fat storage. While it may sound counterintuitive to an uneducated person, you can actually learn to eat a greater number of calories at the same time that you're reducing body fat. In fact, that's how your body was designed to work. Okay? Again, if you manipulate caloric ratios, meal timing, and how you skew those calories throughout the day, that's not only very possible, that's very desirable, and again, that is the way your body was designed and set up to work. Last, we want to provide supplements to support maximum performance. I am a firm believer that supplements are essential to achieving peak, peak athletic performance. A lot of people will argue and say, well, supplements aren't absorbed that efficiently. Well, neither is food. In fact, many supplements are absorbed better and more efficiently because they are almost in a pre-digested format. I also realize that the way food gets processed, distributed, the nutrient content continues to fall. In fact, my personal opinion is, is that foods are basically the source of the macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Everything else, as far as in the essential nutrient category, vitamins and minerals, not so much, depending upon the individual food. Okay, so those are our goals there, right? What it takes to accomplish these goals, we do have to have some knowledge. I'm going to try to teach you some functional aspects of how foods work today. Again, I'm more interested in teaching you how to fish than just delivering a, a list of foods and saying, eat this or this is your menu. You have to understand how carbohydrates function, proteins function, and fats function in your body. It's not hard. It's relatively easy to learn, but then you can apply that throughout your program because we have to remember that as your program changes, as your training changes, right, we have to change our nutritional support. In other words, a marathon runner should not be eating and supplementing like a power lifter, who should not be e eating or training like a sprinter, who should be eating and supplementing like a swimmer. There's different nutrient demands, different metabolic demands according to different training phases. So we have to do a little bit of planning, we have to do a little implementation, and most people may be saying, dude, this is a lot of work. Well, wait a minute, let's get this right. You're telling me that you're going to train three to five days a week, a couple hours at a whack, leave a quart of sweat on the mat, get in the cage, pound, work hard, risk injury, do all the things you're doing, but you're not going to give yourself maybe an hour a week, an hour every two weeks of nutritional planning, which can help give you the results of all that training. Doesn't make sense. Remember, we have to be disciplined. We have to be scientific. When I say scientific, we have to be able not just to go out there blindly. You know, uh, Joe Weider, uh, my former boss, used to say, you know, anybody can work hard. Horses work hard. We need to work hard and train smart. That means being disciplined and planning our nutritional program. We can't just go in and work out. That's not going to get it done. Not to your full potential or capability. All right. The other thing here in jiu-jitsu, we always talk about technique over strength. I get it, but what about technique and strength? I envision jiu-jitsu athletes and MMA fighters to be much stronger, have much more endurance, and be much more capable in the years to come. Just like NFL linebackers, you look at a linebacker 20 years ago and you can look at a linebacker today, night and day in terms of the physical specimens that are out there. Same thing in jiu-jitsu. Now, again, Technique is number one. I get that. I've seen it. I've been tapped out by it, by a, by a 165-pound Brazilian black belt world champion, right? That's not the point. The point is, is let's bring technique excellence, strength excellence, cardio excellence, flexibility excellence all to the game to raise the level of Brazilian jiu-jitsu or MMA to the next level, okay? Be the athlete of the future. That's my goal for each one of you. All right, so during a fight, we have a couple different energy sources. When we do a quick burst, okay, just like a power lifter, a sprinter, when we're shooting for takedowns, whatever it is, that's quick burst energy. That's mostly from the ATP sources of energy in the cell. Adenosine triphosphate, we've heard that maybe before in high school biology. The point is, is think of it almost as free energy in the cell. 
It's there. We don't need to make it, but it only is a very short-lived energy supply, you know, anywhere from 15 to 40 seconds, depending upon which study you read, okay? So that's going to get you through the first burst. And then if you're still out there training with 100% exertion, you're going to switch over to the anaerobic phase. Anaerobic means with oxygen deficit, which means that your body is not delivering enough oxygen at a cellular level to sustain performance, right, and to burn fat. Just like I said there, I used the word burn to indicate that fat actually gets oxidized. Just like a piece of paper, if I put a match to it, okay, the burning of the paper, that's a process of oxidation. Well, you can't burn something without oxygen, right? So if we don't have enough oxygen, if we have an oxygen deficit, we can't burn fat. So that means our energy sources have to be carbohydrates, stored carbohydrates, which is glycogen, or protein. Yes, protein. Protein, which is you know, one of the key functional elements of muscle cells, proteins will get broken down. It's pretty easy to do, actually. You just kind of rip off the two side groups, and you're left with a glucose molecule, a carbohydrate molecule. We want to minimize that happening because we don't want training or fighting or rolling, right, to be a stimulus for breaking down muscle tissue. So we want to resist that as much as possible. So we have this ATP phase, an anaerobic phase, you know, like if you're sprinting or, or wrestling or fighting or grappling or in the cage or rolling jiu-jitsu very hard. And then we have this aerobic phase where we can transition from carbohydrates to burning some fat. Okay, there may be a lull in the action. Most of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, most of, of MMA is in this ATP anaerobic phase. There are some aerobic elements to it, no question, which is the recovery period, which is why we have to make sure that we have the nutrients and the training to support an aerobic base so that we can recover more quickly. Okay. I just want to mention here the effects of the adrenaline dump. If anybody has fought in a tournament uh, or is, has gotten in the cage, you know there can be a tremendous level of anxiety, sometimes fear, no matter how well prepared you are. And if that isn't controlled, you will have a situation where you'll get an adrenaline dump. You'll feel that increase in heart rate and blood pressure, and as a result, your body breaks down a lot of glycogen, dumps a lot of the glucose into the bloodstream, raises a cortisol level, raises neurological activity, but again, it's very short-lived, and it can have the... Uh, athlete be in a situation where they can gas out much earlier than they normally would. Okay, So we'll talk about that later because that carbohydrate glycogen storage is critical to resisting some of the negative effects of that adrenaline dump. Okay, so carbohydrates, let's talk about those for a few minutes, uh, and proteins and fats. So we have our mind around what the functional parts uh, of our diet really mean to the physiology and the performance capability of our bodies. So carbohydrates basically are sugars, right? It can either be simple sugars or 10,000 in length for a starch. And basically, small, simple sugars don't require a lot of digestion. They get absorbed into your bloodstream very, very quickly, causing an increase in your blood sugar level very quickly. Complex carbohydrates are longer chains. They have to get sliced and diced up to release the individual sugars or the uh, smaller sugars anyway that can be absorbed into your bloodstream. So they, so they tend to raise blood sugar levels much more gradually. Okay? Carbohydrate uh, absorption begins in the mouth, and that's important because we have an enzyme called amylase in the mouth where carbohydrates are digested, and we know that chewing is arguably the most important phase of digestion. Okay, so why am I talking about chewing in a, in a peak performance sports nutrition seminar? Because, once again, it is arguably the most important phase of digestion. If we don't chew our food properly, we won't break it down mechanically. We won't create the surface area that we need to to maximize the digestive activity of the enzymes and the bacteria in our stomach and small intestine. Right? So if you want to enhance nutrient absorption, quit eating so fast. Make sure you chew your food adequately, more than adequately, when in doubt. Right? And it also helps with carbohydrate digestion, which begins in the mouth so that we can break it down into simple sugar and get absorbed into the bloodstream or get stored in this element called glycogen. Glycogen is a storage form of carbohydrate. It is in the muscle tissue so that glycogen stored in my biceps will feed my biceps muscle while I'm doing curls, for instance. And it's also stored in the liver. It's stored in the liver because the liver acts as this storage depot 
to release sugar into the bloodstream if your blood sugar level should start to fall. Let's say you're running a, a race and you're running for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour, your blood sugar level is going to continue to fall, right? The glycogen in your liver will be continually dispersed to try to maintain that steady blood sugar level until it no longer can and then it starts to fall. Runners call that hitting the wall, okay? And if you're rolling BJJ or if you're in an MMA fight, you notice that your performance starts to decrease rapidly. Your cognitive capability, how fast you can think and react, that also decreases as well. So we really want to make sure we maximize glycogen storage, which is important. It's related to the physiology of how glucose, blood sugar, right, is regulated. In other words, if we take in a simple sugar on an empty stomach, it's absorbed very quickly, our insulin levels can increase. Now, an insulin level spiking is not necessarily always a bad thing because insulin also drives amino acids into the cell. But at the same time, a great insulin response can also decrease total glycogen storage and replenishment, and it can also result in a reduction in the activity of metabolic pathways in the burning of fat. In other words, your body's saying, hey, insulin only goes up when we got a lot of sugar. Why would we need to burn fat if we got all this sugar? We might need the fat for, the, for a rainy day for survival purposes. So we're going to stop and shut off all those fat metabolic pathways. So the worst thing you want to do is if you're dieting to lose fat is just to have, have a simple sugar on an empty stomach, get that insulin spike, and all those metabolic pathways that you've been working so hard to grow and develop get kind of shut off. So you shot yourself in the foot, all right? So the benefits of a stable blood sugar level are better fat metabolism. I just, just talked about that. Better glycogen storage, more constant energy levels and moods because we know, not that it would apply to anybody here, but uh, some people when they have a drop in blood sugar level, by the way, that is the strongest stimulus to appetite, right? That's what makes you hungry is a drop in blood sugar level. So your blood sugar level goes down, you tend to get very hungry. That is the message, okay? Go find food. And if your blood sugar level really goes down, you get really hungry and you tend to overeat. That's that binge, uh, binge eating pattern, which is not the best way to maintain constant energy levels, constant mood levels, constant cognitive capability. We know we don't think well when we uh, have a low blood sugar level. And when I say think well, that means when we're rolling BJJ, we're not going to be able to access our technique arsenal, our technique library filed away in our brain as quickly or as efficiently as we want to. We also get better appetite regulation, I mentioned that, and also we know that if we have adequate uh, blood sugar levels, it's going to be protein sparing. In other words, we don't need to break down proteins to form glucose because we have enough glucose already existing in the cell or in the bloodstream to be able to supply and support our energy demands. All right, low carb diets, I want to mention those because uh, low carb diets are not something that should be sustained for very long periods of time at all. The reason is, is that every gram of glycogen is bound to approximately three grams of water. So if we diminish or reduce or restrict or completely deny carbohydrates being put into our body, our body is going to burn the glycogen that we have already stored, which is going to release that three grams of water that every gram of glycogen is bound to. And as a result, you're going to end up making more bathroom trips. Anybody who's been on a low carb diet knows that you're going to be making more bathroom trips uh, for the first two, three, four days of a low carb diet than normal. Well, a gallon of water weighs 8.14 pounds. So if you end up, you know, urinating a, you know, a gallon of water, basically, which is not that hard to do over a period of a day or two or three, certainly, you can drop eight pounds, you can drop 10 pounds. Hey, isn't this low carb diet? Great, I lost weight. Well, again, we don't want to lose weight, <clears throat> we want to lose body fat. Think about body composition. Nobody wants to go from a big pair to a small pair, right? We also know that low carb diets will tend to deplete the body of electrolytes. Your energy level and your performance goes down as well. So we want to be very careful of that. The glycemic index is just an index which kind of gives you a relative idea of how quickly carbohydrates deliver sugar into the bloodstream. A low glycemic index foods are, tend to be better choices for most athletes instead of the high glycemic uh, index foods. One, for example, something that's you know, at the top of the scale of zero to 100 would be fruit juices because it doesn't have any fiber with it, it's liquid, it's concentrated, and it can cause a very rapid increase in blood sugar level. All right, so we have a few facts here about carbohydrates, and our, our eating habits are going to be impacted by some of those facts. Protein now. We know that protein is composed of amino acids. 
We know that the amino acids are the building blocks of the structural elements of our body, muscle, hair, nails, hormones, and enzymes. Even hormones and enzymes are protein-based, right? We know that the metabolic effects of protein can be quite pronounced. Any time that we eat, it costs us energy. In other words, if you're sitting here and you're burning so many calories per minute, if we served you a meal, your caloric burn rate would go up. It takes energy to chew, takes energy to swallow and start to digest. Well, protein is one of the things that can boost your metabolic rate most dramatically. Some studies have demonstrated 20 to 30 percent. Now that's interesting because if you're trying to burn body fat, you're trying to increase your basal metabolic rate, it's nice to know that you can have two, three, four, five, six small protein, 15 to 20 gram uh, type protein meals to a day, whether in the form of supplements or food, and keep your metabolic rate elevated and active. Okay? We don't need to eat a ton of protein. A gram of protein per pound of lean body mass for an intense training ath athlete tends to be pretty close to enough, maybe a little bit more than that. But some of these bodybuilders I've worked with uh, are taking, you know, three, four, 450 grams of protein a day. Uh, that can put some stress on your internal organs, and it's not really addressing the needs of your body properly, in my opinion. So protein is an energy source. We know it's a secondary energy source during anaerobic training. We know carbohydrates and glycogen are, and glucose are the primary energy sources during anaerobic training, right? But protein is number two. And the first proteins that get used are the branch chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and also glutamine. Those are the first amino acids that your muscle goes catabolic for, in other words, will break down proteins for, and they're the last ones replenished, which is why they're important in the pre-workout formulations. Right? Protein requirements are based most strongly on activity levels and lean body mass. Male and female or age are really less relevant, uh, if depending upon how active you are and, again, how much muscle tissue you're carrying around. All right, fats. Notice here, fats are nine calories per gram. Protein is four calories per gram. Carbohydrate is four calories per gram. So that means that fat are more than two times as calorically dense as either protein or carbohydrates. Now what does that mean? That means that if I was eating 3,000 calories a day with a very, very low fat concentration, I could probably fill up this table here with food. Okay? And when I say fill up this table, I mean it would be, you know, chicken breast, and it would be yams, and it would be a number of components, right, with, to get me up to 3,000 calories. Or I could have a, a couple double cheeseburgers, a fries, and a shake and be at 3,000 calories because it's 65% of those calories coming from fat, right? The caloric density is greatly and dramatically increased. Okay, so... Fat is an essential dietary component. Before we badmouth fats too much, we have to remember that they're essential, essential for recovery, essential for nervous system um, recovery and functionality as well. It plays a role in hormone and cell membrane production. It is also involved in the transport of uh, fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. And it's a primary energy during aerobic work, right? So the metabolic effects, we know that fats can slow the rate of transit in your gut tube. In other words, how fast food is moved throughout your GI tract. It's important to note that the GI tract is really not a static organ system. It's not a piece of PVC pipe. In other words, it's highly adaptable, just like muscle tissue. The beautiful thing about a human body is, is you put a five horsepower strain on a three horsepower human body, you end up with a five horsepower human body. If you put a five horsepower strain on a three horsepower motor, you burn out the motor. Same thing really with our GI tract. As we adapt our eating behavior and eat small frequent meals, food tends to move through us more quickly and at the same time, nutrient absorption tends to become increased. That's a key component because as we know that food is passed out more quickly, it's much more healthy for us, uh, reduces the risk of, of uh, colon cancer and a number of other diseases that are associated with slow food transit rates. And for an athlete, it also helps that nutrient absorption, which is critical to performance. Water. One more element that I would just want to mention is that We've got carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Water is such a critical element. Obviously, 70 plus percent of our body is composed of water. 
so many of the metabolic processes in energy production and growth in tissue repair involve a chemical reaction which involves hydrolysis. Hydro sounds like it involves water. It does. Uh, in fact, you cannot break up really a storage form of fat without the process of hydrolysis. So that means that if you are dehydrated or underhydrated, you are impairing your body's ability to access, break down, mobilize, and burn fat as an energy source. So we want to make sure that we are always are hydrated. When I say hydrated, most people are underhydrated, if not dehydrated. So a sedentary person needs eight to 10 eight ounce glasses of water a day. An athlete can drink much more than that just to maintain their normal hydration levels. Also too, I've seen athletes carry around jugs of water, distilled water. I don't advocate that. Distilled water has no mineral content at all. As such, it functionally decreases, depletes, diminishes the amount of mineral concentration in your body and can actually excrete them um, to the point where you can end up with a, a, a potassium, a sodium, a calcium imbalance because of long-term distilled water usage. Not the best way to go. The other one aspect I want to mention regarding dieters is, is that the, the, uh, the system of feedback for monitoring blood glucose is very sensitive. We know if our blood glucose falls. We can feel that. We can start to get tired. We can start to get hungry right away. We don't have a good, accurate, specific feedback system when it comes to hydration levels. In other words, if we only drank when we were thirsty, we would probably always be under or inadequately hydrated. The other thing is, is that a lot of times when we're underhydrated, our brain kind of interprets that as being hungry. So if you're on a diet where you're trying to lose fat and you're hungry, okay, try hitting a water cooler before you hit the refrigerator and you'll notice that sometimes your appetite can be curbed by using that technique. Alrighty, so we've looked at a number of functional elements and understanding of how food is broken down and used as an energy source and a replenishment source in our body. So how do we create a diet plan? Well, the first place to build a diet plan is going to be contingent upon what your protein requirements are. Okay? We have to make sure that we get those protein requirements met first, then build an inadequate carbohydrate base to make sure we have our energy system demands uh, and requirements met. And then we also want to make sure that that includes an adequate amount of fats for recuperation and proper neurological functioning as well. Remember that unique metabolic demands are created by specific training programs. As such, the unique metabolic demands of training have to be augmented and supported by the perfectly fitting combination of a proper nutritional program. That means, again, caloric ratios need to change at different phases of your training. When you're in the strength phase, when you're in the anaerobic development phase, when you're in the integration phase, the energy demands and the nutrient intake should change. Okay, I used an example in this slide of 65% carbohydrates, 25% protein, 10% fat. That is only an example. I am not saying that this is the way that anyone should eat. However, a pre-competitive bodybuilder, for instance, may follow a ratio like this. A jiu-jitsu fighter would need to have more fat, lower protein, and a higher concentration of carbohydrate. He may be more around 50% carbs you know, 25% protein and maybe 20 or 25% fat, depending upon where he is or she is in their training cycle. Okay, so protein needs are based on two things. I mentioned them earlier. One is activity levels. The second is lean body mass. Now, when I say lean body mass, let's say someone weighs 200 pounds. Not all of that 200 pounds is lean body mass. Some of that is going to be fat, right? For our purposes, we can use the two to be almost synonymous. For instance, we look at a 200-pound at a, a male right here, right? And we say, all right, that's his lean body weight. And his need factor is going to be anywhere from 0.5 grams of protein per pound of lean body weight all the way up to 1 gram of protein per pound of lean body weight. Now, some studies have demonstrated that an, an elite athlete, you know, who's uh, you know, more bodybuilding, powerlifting re related than a, a BJJ or an MMA athlete is, could use up to 1.2 to 1.4 grams of protein per pound of lean body mass at certain phases of their, of their training. But for our purposes, I think that this gets us pretty close to understanding what our needs really are, saying that a couch potato needs a half a gram of protein 
uh, per pound of lean body mass, and somebody who's training three, four, five times a week needs more like a gram. We've made it easy for you and used this, this chart to say, all right, if you're 200 pounds, you're training hard, one gram per pound, guess what? You need 200 grams of protein. If you're 170 pounds and you're only training twice a week, well, maybe you'd want to go with this 0.7 here, which means you'd need 119 grams of protein. Just a very easy, accessible way to break down protein needs. Once you understand your protein needs, you build out the rest of your diet. You know that each gram of protein has four calories per gram, right? And we know that whatever that number is, if you want it to be 25% of your total calories or 30% of your total calories, it's just an easy arithmetic problem to figure out how many grams of carbohydrates and how many grams of fat you would be needing. Again, this example is that 65, 25, 10, and it breaks down caloric intake by the grams of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats that it would be appropriate to take in. You can change and should change those percentages. Again, I'm trying to teach you how to develop a nutritional program as opposed to give you one because it's definitely not a one-size-fits-all. So once we have our numbers, we say, all right, now it's a question of how do we ingest this food? Well, a couple other basic rules. One is, is that we want to have small frequent feedings four to six times per day, right? We know that that increases the rate of food transit. We know it increases metabolic rate. We know that it uh, relates to more efficient glycogen storage. And remember, we want to go into our workouts, our mat training sessions, full of glycogen, as full as possible, really, so we can resist that body's capability or temptation to break down proteins, which are in, in part going to take away from the muscle tissue growth, development, recuperation, or repair. All right. We know it also stabilizes blood sugar levels and levels of amino acid, stabilizes appetite, etc. All right, so small frequent feedings are the way to go. We also talked about the benefits of small frequent feedings of proteins, you know, particularly if you're trying to boost your metabolic rate. So that's one factor. Does that mean you take all those numbers and divide it by four, or divide it by six? Not necessarily. We have to place our bets okay, and pay our first bills, if you will, okay, to the meals that are most important. And when I ask groups like this, typically what's the most important meal of the day, a lot of people will say what? They'll say breakfast. Breakfast, no question, is a very important meal of the day. The reason is, is because as you first rise, your body's metabolic rate is elevated, then it tapers out down throughout the day. Well, our caloric intake should marry and be exactly concurrent with the energy demands of the body. So we should have a greater number of calories earlier in the day and have them taper out later, right? Makes sense. So that if I looked at metabolic caloric expenditure and nutrient intake, it should be two curves that trace each other almost identically, right? That's an ideal situation. In most countries that I know, particularly the United States, people do it just the opposite. They skip breakfast, grab a quick lunch, and then eat a steak dinner with all the trimmings, and their nutrient intake starts out down here and then ramps up as the day goes on, which is the exact opposite of what our metabolic needs are. As a result, you don't get the nutrients when you need them, and you ingest a whole bunch of nutrients after the fact, which results in them being put into storage. Okay? So you can have two people eating 3,000 calories, and how they time their meals has a completely different physiological effect. So breakfast is important, but there's one meal that's even more critical to athletic performance, right? And that is the pre-workout meal. That's part, the first part of it. The second, even more important part, is the post-workout meal. So let me just say it clearly. The most important meal of the day to not mess up is that post-workout meal. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, do your intense workout. You're going to have, you know, five... 10 minute rolls and you're going to go hard and you're going to be dripping sweat and you're going to go in the locker room and sit down and have a steak baked potato and, and, and uh, broiled asparagus, right? That's not going to work. It's not going to be fun. You're still worked up, but you still have that nutrient demand, which is ex accelerated really within that 30 to 45 minutes after training period of time. In other words, the 30 to 45 minutes after completion of a workout, your body has the capability to absorb and store twice the glycogen at twice the rate and replenish proteins unlike any other time throughout the day. And that's a result of some hormonal level changes, your body's sensitivity to insulin changes during that time. It's a very unique metabolic situation. If we don't take advantage of that window opportunity, 
we will never be capable of replenishing 100% of our glycogen level within a 24-hour period of time. So that means you're going to go into tomorrow's training session suboptimally replenished, which means you're going to increase the risk of a catabolic process ensuing the next workout. That's something we want to avoid at all costs. So what does that mean functionally? It means that you need to supplement, because that's the most efficient way I can know to do it and, and recommend to you, supplement the diet with carb drinks or protein drinks or meal replacement drinks right after a workout or even during a training session. You can have a, uh, a shaker, have your powder in it, be able to mix it up and sip it throughout the workout. And as you sip it, continue to fill water in the container so that it becomes progressively more dilute, okay? Because the, the more dilute a drink is, the faster it can get absorbed, right? So take advantage of that post-workout window of opportunity do it quickly, don't miss it. On the pre-workout side, we want to have a small amount of protein, small amount of carbs, just to stabilize blood sugar levels. We also want to make sure that that's the time we focus on the branched chain amino acids and glutamine. Okay, I also have this meal timeline because really you want to map out what you're eating and when you're eating. It doesn't take a lot of brain power to do this, but you do have to have a plan. Remember, all those hours in the gym are going to be I don't want to say wasted completely, but certainly not potentiated, right, if you don't maximize the nutritional support of your program. Again, talk to any competitive bodybuilder and athletes who really got this down, and they will tell you, I've heard this dozens and dozens of times in my career, that they credit nutrition with 80% of their success on the physical performance side. So again, remember, training is just a stimulus. A very critical stimulus has to be a very scientifically driven and judiciously driven stimulus. But nonetheless, the results happen outside of the gym after training is open by way of recuperation, which is predominantly determined by nutrition, right? So spend the time, do this little bit of homework. You spend so many hours on the mat as it is, that's good just to spend a little bit more time and come up with a program that maps out what you're eating, when you're eating, when you're eating which section of carbs, proteins, and also noticing that you're taking advantage of each one of these windows of opportunity. For example, this example shows someone training between five and six at night, fairly realistic, uh, and right afterwards and within a short period of time, within about 20 minutes, they're getting 75 grams of carbohydrates. Now, is 75 grams enough? I don't know, it depends on the size of the person. I tend to think that uh, you know, a 170-pound uh, guy would probably need you know, more like 100, 125 grams of carbohydrates. Doesn't matter, please, when you, when you pull this up, when you come on jujitsumania.com, this is not something to pin to your wall and become your program. This is the model for understanding. You're gonna need to change things a little bit and find what works for you according to where you are in your training. Okay, so this is a food list. Uh, my partner, Joe Mullings, put this together. Uh, he is uh, the strength and conditioning coach of uh, Junior Edson Barbosa, Luis Kane, not to mention some other top guys. And these are some of the foods that comprise the diet of those athletes. We put that on there, uh, and if, when you tune into the strength and conditioning phase of, of our seminar track, you'll see uh, Joe refer to this as well, so that you have at least a grocery list, if you will. Uh, this is a checklist so that the days of the week will be across the top, and so many servings of each one of these foods will be checked off. You can use that, again, as a guide, just so you get some, uh, some kind of freshness in your diet. You don't get bored eating the same thing. And then there's also an example of a meal plan that can be used to give you a guideline in a starting place as well, okay? All right, so let's talk about some nutritional support in terms of supplementation. Again, I mentioned earlier in the program that I'm a firm believer in supplementation. I think it is virtually impossible to meet the essential nutrient demands of your body just relying on food. Once you figure how food is stored and transported and cooked, all those things diminish nutrient capacity, right? So we know that all these essential nutrients, the, the B vitamins, vitamin C, D, E, all those components are, are critical. Uh, I've got a little bit of an explanation for each one of them. Suffice to say that B vitamins are intimately tied to protein and carbohydrate and energy metabolism, uh, also nervous system function, also dealing with stress. And again, the stress of, of uh, BJJ or MMA training uh, needs to be addressed by a good foundation of B vitamins. We know that vitamin C is a chief component of connective tissue healing and repair. And that's critical because joints, tendons, and ligaments you know, over time can tend to break down with extreme stress. So we want to take, take care of those and maintain also coronary arteries uh, are maintained. 
uh, much more efficiently with higher levels of vitamin C. Vitamin D, again, so many things that vitamin D does. We know it's also been linked with a great decrease in overall many types of cancers. Uh, it's also involved in so many metabolic pathways, as is vitamin E and selenium. They work together in a pair. Zinc, which helps regulate testosterone and estrogen levels in males. Now, you know, most guys don't talk about estrogen levels, but a higher estrogen level, which can happen when an athlete is under the extreme stress of training, can actually have a greater negative impact than a low testosterone level can. So we want to make sure uh, that uh, zinc is a, is a component of the diet. Iodine, another critical one for thyroid function. The thyroid hormone is, com is uh, composed, really, of some core elements of iodine. And back years ago, they used to have iodized salt. Now that's gotten uh, more expensive. Most salt that we take in is not iodized. And there's many people who have been able to change their thyroid function just by adding iodine to their diet. Okay, calcium, magnesium, again, we know for, again, bro bones and joints. And I also list probiotics. Probiotics are bacterial sources which help normalize the flora, the intestinal content, if you will, of our intestine. That's what digests most of our food in terms of liberating the nutrient elements for absorption into our bloodstream. So if you've taken antibiotics in the past six months, or even if you haven't, extreme stress, cortisol levels will also change the balance of the normal flora. And it's essential to have optimal gut tube health so that we can get optimal absorption and optimal performance. Okay, so a couple things here to support muscle growth, workout recovery, and control cortisol. Remember, cortisol is that stress hormone when you get that adrenaline dump. A couple things, glutamine uh, also is, is key to immune system function, and we know that we're under the stress of training. Our immune system is under a lot of stress. We want to make sure that we can recover, not end up with a lot of colds uh, or other illnesses, right, which can take us, make us uh, take a step back in our training. Uh, the branch chains, HICA, an interesting supplement. We uh, have an article on jujitsumania.com about HICA. The studies were done on wrestlers and lean body mass. Pretty amazing stuff. Please check that out. Uh, beta alanine, which is a metabolic byproduct of carnosine. Uh, we know it also enhances muscular performance and endurance. Okay? We consider that critical, as we do, obviously, this carb replenishment drink and the protein drink as well. Okay, to increase cardio capacity, a couple of things. Many of them have already uh, been discussed or familiar to you in other supplements. Uh, the carnitine, coenzyme Q10, lipoic acid, beta alanine, omega-3s, the fish oils. We know that they have also been linked to enhance performance or recuperation on the aerobic side. And this one up here, again, we've got a, a very interesting article on Jiu-Jitsu Mania about astaxanthin. Uh, it is an algae source uh, of a very interesting, unique uh, set of uh, uh, components, if you will, uh, that affect uh, aerobic capacity um, in a very positive way. I've got personal experience uh, in using this and uh, are a pretty strong supporter of what its effects can be. I want to mention the Guspari uh, Peak Performance Stack. I had mentioned them. They're one of our sponsors, uh, and I was interested uh, in their performance stack because what they have done is they've tried to address the key elements of the nutritional demands of a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or an MMA fighter, okay, with three product formulations. The first one is Anavite, which is their sport multivitamin formula. It also has beta alanine and carnitine in it. So, again, that essential nutrient demand can be addressed. Uh, also, they have the Super Pump Max, which is their pre-workout formula with some of the branch chains and other components to support, again, what your body will be breaking down and accessing for an energy source during your workouts. And then lastly, Myofusion, which is their post-workout formula with high-quality, highly absorbable, bioavailable protein. So, again, check those formulas out. As you do your homework, you're going to be looking specifically for the nutrients that your body is going to need to support Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA training. So give these some consideration. All right, lastly on the list here, uh, again, that whole joint health issue. You know, if you're a younger guy, younger female, you're an athlete, you feel good, you don't think about long-term joint issues. When you get into your 40s and 50s, you will, right? So we want to make, make, maintain proper joint function. Also, if you've had any joint injuries, uh, which happens a lot in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you get a hyperextension or you start to pull a tendon or strain a muscle. Uh, these components, the MSN, vitamin C, and chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine uh, can be very important factors in helping your body maintain the joints and connective tissues from breakdown. Okay.
So the last thing is, is uh, please come and visit us on jujitsumania.com. Uh, we've got hundreds of videos. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel with hundreds of thousands of hits on it. And our whole goal is not just to talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu technique, although that's the core of our site, but also to talk about performance nutrition and also uh, strength and conditioning because we believe in the athletes of the future. We believe that fighters, whether they're Jiu-Jitsu fighters or MMA fighters, are going to be stronger, have more physical capability, better flexibility, better recuperation uh, to go along with that great, great technique. So please join us. And again, uh, I thank uh, our sponsors, you know, House of Pain, Gaspari Nutrition, uh, and Mass Suits for making this, uh, this program possible.